Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the SALSI full year results presentation for the year ended December 2019 and the turnaround strategy update. I would now have to turn the conference over to Douglas Kerrigy Stevenson. Please go ahead. Thank you, Chris. Uh, good morning, everybody, um, and thank you for joining for this um, uh, webcast update. Um, I think I'd just like to start off by saying there's two real purposes in this presentation today. One is obviously to uh, present results for the um, full year into December 2019. And the second is to uh, give you some feedback as to where we are with regards to the turnaround strategy and as it's taking shape and then give you more um, feedback in terms of what we've actually done at a granular level within the organization. I think we've got a very good story to tell today. Uh, there's obviously a lot of concern about Telfi where it is at the moment, and there's been, I think, a lot of circumspection in the media as to where we are and what we're doing. So I'm hoping to be able to clear up all of that with you today. I will be presenting the full year's results as well as the comparative between the first half and the second half of, of last year. I think it's important for us to highlight what is coming out of that, um, especially as pertains to the direction taken with regards to specifically getting the um, operational efficiencies within the organization and um, displaying the um, strength of the business going forward with regards to, um, you know, the case for the recapitalization. And then also to show that we are, we've, we've delivered on an old model and are very well positioned to move into the second phase of our, of our new strategy with um, MTN in the phase two um, portion. So with that, I'm going to carry on with the presentation. The agenda is broken down into six fundamental portions before we take questions. One being the uh, Salsi journey right the way, the strategy, the results, our highlights, specifically our balance sheet, and then, and then some of the way forward, and then we will take questions. Um, moving then on to the Salsi journey, I think it's important for me to maybe just remind everybody of where this organization was um, as a company it had been in the market for now 20 years as you're all very much well aware um, it's never really shown a profit in that period it's followed a similar type of strategy to what the other mobile network operators have have um, followed it was trying to keep up with a very capital intensive model the the mere fact that uh, vodacom and mtn are so far ahead of us never made it really feasible for us to continue investing the inornate amounts of CapEx that we would have had to invest. And my sort of base calculation of that would probably be that we would need to have invested circa 10 to 15 billion a year just to, to keep up. You'll all be aware that obviously with the technology changes on the bearers going from 3 to 4 to 5G, we need to be positioned properly to be able to, to serve in the market as we should. And, and, and the capital model wasn't going to be the way for us going forward. The previous strategy had really also hinged around a situation where we had our own network and then we would build on with uh, roaming agreements. And so the narrative was that you built your network as, and substituted out the roaming while you were, while, while you were trying to compete with uh, the two incumbents. What we've effectively done now is change that whole narrative in terms of putting it now more to a uh, CapEx for OPEX substitution. And a lot of that will We'll, we'll hinge around making sure that we can keep an operational expenditure charge to the to the correct levels where it would actually be less than what the capital requirement would be, and that's very much in the in the design of what we're doing. So that said, I think it sort of sets where we were as as a business. The recap of 2017 was not successful. We still had a far too high debt stack and a far too high cost of capital at the time. I think if I may just add that it's important for us in these results to show that we do have a sustainable business going forward. And in that, with the sustainable business going forward, which you will see in the performance differential between H1 and H2, does set us into the right place for a, for a capitalization to take place and that there is an actual factor business case for, for the organization to move forward. So with that, we, we obviously carried on over the course of uh, H2 of last year with the focus around the, the efficiencies and that you would have seen various things coming through from, from the renegotiation, obviously, of the MTN deal, the final um, ending of the black content platform, uh, a number of other things that we're doing in terms of, of, of renegotiating contracts, et cetera, within the organization. And then the big hinge on the network strategy uh, to be able to get us into a new capital structure. The results at the end of H2 do show that we are able to carry a, a reasonable debt stack that would be in line with where the business should be. 
um, and that's a good takeaway which we'll talk about later in the presentation in terms of the in terms of the turn in terms of the turnaround strategy i think it's important to to show that we can demonstrate that we have in fact um, made operational efficiencies you will see that in the latter half of the year we um, were able to uh, grow service revenue and we were able to contribute substantially to an increase in, in, in EBITDA. And that performance then obviously allows us to be able to, to pitch for a, a successful recap and uh, maintain a sustainable debt stack. If I move forward into that, I've got a, a graph here that shows the old and the new. The results are going to cover what, what is in the, in the old model effectively. It will talk to what we've had in, in expenditure. It will talk to how we've managed the liquidity platform going forward. Uh, it's important to note that uh, between Zaf and myself, we've been managing this liquidity platform for the better part of almost a year now. And then obviously the, the turnaround strategy must hinge on that to move us then into a new way of running a network and then a post recapitalization, what the business will go and look like going forward. Um, understanding that we are we will focus on being a customer centric network, being able to deliver uh, uh, services over the uh, traditional megs and minutes type of a model. Um, if I look at the four pillars of the strategy that that's on slide um, number seven, we've um, continued with that uh, narrative since we, we, we started this um, uh, change in direction. Uh, the number one issue being the liquidity um, focus. The liquidity platform is tightly managed and is in place at the moment, and we have got enough liquidity to carry us through until until we get to a um, recap. There is an informal debt standstill in terms of, of, of the current debt and, at the moment. And while we do get the odd question about, about payments in liquidity, we do manage this on, on a daily basis. So the informal debt standstill, I think is important to talk to the fact that there is definitely value in the business going forward. And that um, once it's been run properly, we would be able to, to, to um, get the recap finalized. The network strategy, um, is obviously this evolution between a capex intense infrastructure based network to being able to effectively lease network and so that opex or capex substitution i'll talk to it a little bit more later um, allows us to to get away from the, the continued uh, demand for 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 capex intense and then the expanding uh, roaming agreement with mtn has effectively been concluded that just deals with uh, pillar number two. Going on to pillar number three, the operational rationalization. The big issue here is making sure that we, two things. One, we cannot cut, cut costs to save ourselves to profitability. You will see that we did not do that. We were very clear on making sure that we allocated the direct uh, resources of expenditure into, into the right place, be it uh, revenue protection, um, uh, product rationalization and the like, and to get the business to to really start um, spending at the right margin level. So we have had an, in, uh, an increase in the gross margin, which you will see, but it's not, in my opinion, anywhere near enough. Uh, we have opportunity to continue with that expansion going into the course of 2020, which we will. It will also largely be uh, easier to do post um, the recapitalization, but we continue to show that we can extract value out of it through cost efficiency and revenue generating activity. So two fundamental things coming out of operational rationalization is one cost management and the second traffic management and the like within the uh, network which is very important you'll also see that we had a substantial decrease in subscriber numbers and then it's not in my mind um, a big issue at this particular stage of the game as it's, you will see in the in the ARPU differences that in fact a lot of the subscribers that we've that have come off the base have been non-revenue generating or opportunistic subscribers and also talks to the fact that we have this massive prepaid washing machines of SIM cards going out into the market. And then the last thing that is in, in progress at the moment is, is the capital restructure. It is a complex restructure, there's multiple stakeholders. The structures are being discussed at the moment and all parties remain vested in the process. I do. Um, I would like to limit certain amounts of questions with regards to the state of the of the recap of the um, recaps, purely on the basis of the fact that it's more a shareholder issue and management's responsibility to talk to to the point of getting the business into the right shape and making sure that we have a reason to recap. If I start off into the results, I'd like um, you to look at the results from two angles. The first is obviously the full year set of results, which um, you can see there. We had a slight. Um, reduction of the um, service revenue of, of around 1%. The, 
the EBITDA coming in 15% lower and then the capital expenditure only staying at 2%. It's important to understand that the network has been starved of capital expenditure for quite some time now. And obviously that has to a certain extent an impact on the service revenue. But what's more important to take away from the slide is the second portion, and that is what happened in the second half of the year. If you look at H1 versus H2, in the end of 2018, it's fair to say we were coming out of of a sort of hubris of not acknowledging the fact that we needed to make some substantial changes within the organization. Um, but we managed to increase service revenue by around 4% between H1 and H2. And we also managed to um, have a substantial lift in the EBITDA over the, over the half year of 136%, adding a, an extra billion rand of EBITDA into, into the business, which has made the recap case that much more um, sound and attractive. If I have a look at the, at the 2019 to 2018 full year results and take into consideration what we've just said with regards to the comparative of H1 to H2, you can see the service revenue is, is, is marginally down at sort of 100 plus million. Uh, Non-service revenue also down. It also needs to be understood that in the non-service revenue, we've moved away from uh, subsidizing the wrong type of customers and focusing on making sure that we, we cannot stay in a subsidy race um, infinitum. So we have to apply that cost very carefully in terms of generating the service revenue relative to the direct expenditure that would be around that. Uh, total revenue then coming in at sort of 500 million below um, what we were in 2018. Gross margin, um, a little bit under pressure. The reason, the main reason about the gross margin pressure, obviously we'd exited the first quarter of 2019 with a substantial out of bundle spend um, on MT. And if you were to add that back, um, you would see that we would pick up around 500 million on the on the on the gross margin, so we we get to a fundamentally better position with regards to that. So that was part of the renegotiation of of certain of the terms within the MTN agreement, um, which has now manifested itself into the H2. The total EBITDA then coming in at 2.5 billion, but as I said, if you were to look at some of the one-off costs that we've taken in the first half of the year, in actual fact, if we add back that, we would have probably come into a closer 3.2 billion EBITDA, um, but we have arrested that run rate. And so you can see that the difference between H1 and H2 with the circa billion and, and, and not wanting to look too far forward, but we're maintaining that trajectory that obviously would increase into an EBITDA margin. The other number that needs to be discussed here is, is the um, impairments that were taken through of the 3.28 billion um, non-cash uh, non impairments. I'll talk to those a little bit later in the presentation, but essentially they belong or relate to um, network infrastructure that we would have to impair um, under the IFRS rules. I think what is the next most important thing to understand is the adoption of IFRS 16 on the financial statements. Um, it's, it's easy to go and look back at the EBITDA numbers, so we've reconciled them um, just to, to, to show what the impact of the IFRS 16 was. Um, as, we, as the operating leases get recognized as a finance expense, you obviously have a lift in the EBITDA, and the value of that for the, for the two comparative years is sort of circa 1.5 billion, 1.4 billion, which would then you bring back to a closing EBITDA 3.8 and 4.4 respectively. Um, and then you can see on the right side of the slide, we talk to the impact of that on the balance sheet, uh, including and excluding IFRA. So that's what you'll see in the, in the fixed assets portion of the balance sheet later in the deck. Moving on to the H1 versus H2, which I think is, is probably the big slide here. Um, if you have a look on the, on the right, you see the, the fundamental difference in the EBITDA. This is the 1 billion rand of EBITDA that is real cash EBITDA that has come into the organization. And you will see later in the balance sheet that we've in actual fact been able to pay down a certain amount of debt as well. There's been no increase of, of debt on the balance sheet, which I think given the trading circumstances of last year is, is, is testimony to the amount of, of cash translated EBITDA that has come through. So if you have a look at revenue, um, including and excluding IFRS and, uh, for H1 and H2, you can, you can see the clear difference in H2. We're up 3%, total mobile revenue up 4%. Prepaid revenue up 2% and direct expenditure down, which has given us an expansion in the gross margin um, of 9%. So coming in at 3.8 versus 3.5 and then operating expenditure down by 18%, um, which talks to the operating efficiencies that we've managed to, to, to extract out of the business, resulting then on that 136% lift in the EBITDA between H1 and H2. 
and obviously would be the going forward uh, EBITDA run rate um, into 2020, uh, notwithstanding obviously the impacts that may come as a result of, of, of the global issues, the rand dollar exchange rate, uh, the coronavirus and, and a number of other things. Um, just a, a, a sort of a headline slide on slide 14, uh, there you can see it in a, in a much easier form. But I think what's important to take away from this is that EBITDA, EBIT before impairments of 705 million is probably the highlight of the second half of the year, which shows that with the correct debt stack, um, we actually have a very sustainable business that's quite capable of paying back debt and incurring debt for the right reasons. But obviously one needs to have an adequate capital allocation model to, to be able to understand what you're spending money on and, and in fact on all of the expenditure lines within the business. And that is what Zaf and my, my management team have been aggressively attacking in the course of the last half of, of last year is to ensure that we, as I said earlier, make sure that we spend the correct money on the correct return within the organization. If I look at our revenue story, we've man, managed to maintain revenue while right-sizing the customer base. I think it's very important that we have a look at what's happened with us with with uh, with our revenue by subscriber type. Um, obviously, this does does not take into consideration the movements between H1 and H2, but you do see a, a decline in the mobile revenue of two percent. However, the, the the bulk of that took taking place in the first half of the year and us recovering back in the second half of the year. What is uh, uh, noteworthy in this is that we've had the growth uh, in the wholesale area of around twelve percent. The other income, which is made up of FTTH, bulk SMS and content sales and the like, is also up by 22%. Broadband, we've managed to stay, despite the um, press coverage that we exited out of the broadband. I think what needs to be cleared up there was that we exited out of the wholesale broadband environment where we were giving away a substantial portion of our network capacity for very little return on the revenue line. The contract base is sort of not moving, but there is obviously a migration between the hybrid and postpaid on the contract. It's also testimony to the amount of um, subsidy that we would put into it. As I said, we want to make sure that we subsidize the right type of clients onto the network and that we've got a bona fide subscriber at the end of the day. It's also noteworthy that the mobile revenue is net of all the volume discounts that go through there. So that's an IFRS 15 adjustment that also needs to be considered. Um, moving on to the actual subscriber base itself, um, you will see that the prepaid base is down 21%. And before everybody gets alarmed on that, I think it's important to note that the prepaid ASPU has actually gone up by 2%, which indicates to us that we had a huge amount of sort of washing machine SIM cards and distribution type SIM cards in the in the network. And um, I'm sure you'll be well aware that we're pushing out as an industry probably in excess of 100 million SIM cards, if not more in a year. And obviously we are connecting very little bona fide subscribers in that. So, Total cost of acquisition is down 43% annually, which allowed us to to um, keep the margin preservation there and up to up 7.5%. So we are connecting better customers and focusing on profitable subscribers and definitely not taking a position where we will chase subscriber which is to my mind, a cosmetic indicator at any expense. We have to be certain that we're getting good quality subscribers. The responsibility on the network side, obviously, being that we would have to make sure that we have a product set to talk to that particular subscriber, that we support subscribers at all levels in the in the economic environment of this country. And so you will have different packages going out for different types of subscriber cohorts, which I think is a huge opportunity that we have as a network going forward as we take our responsible place in, 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 in society. The contract base down 5%, um, also largely on the back of dramatically lower subsidies. Um, or APU has increased 9%. Um, I, I kind of talked to the example of an iPhone costing around 26,000 Rand where you've got a deal going out there where the recovery on the contract doesn't even make up 20,000 of it. So one has to be more realistic about what you're going to do with sub, uh, subsidy within the postpaid contract base and make sure that your, that your customers um, are, are being subsidized for the right product and the right reason. Broadband um, down 6%, a lot of the broadband base um, obviously coming off some of the changes that we've made with, with the products, but the ARPU up 17% as we are more selective on the deal value. Fiber to the home revenue up 36% off a smaller base, but it is definitely growing quickly. Um, obviously, I think now there is a lot of, one has to talk to what the impact of this coronavirus is, is going to be. I think that uh, if there's a really protracted amount of time with corona, uh, we are going to sit with a situation where we have substantial changes in the way we're going to do business as as a as a country and as a as an economy in general. 
there is a huge up, upside in fiber for us to be able to to get into a position where we can sell fiber. Fiber is ultimately the best way to connect um, for a business. The downside that everybody forgets is that fiber is very much linked to electricity provision, so load shedding doesn't help the fiber base at all. So I think that there will be a, a step or stop gap between a fixed broadband and being able to migrate customers into a fiber offering. If I have a look at the MVNO base, uh, the base is up 11%. We've still managed to grow that despite reducing prices that our MVNO has paid and the growth was um, to a certain extent curtailed due to certain of the uh, financial instability. Obviously, we are aware we have got strong MVNOs on our base and and they obviously were concerned and have to be managed with regards to um, where we find ourselves as a business. But that said, prepaid um, contract and broadband op is all on the rise um, as we flush out the base and get towards a much more profitable base with the correct product set to support that. If I move on to the um, optimization of the network traffic to improve profitability, I think that has been a, a, a huge issue. We've managed to reduce data traffic over the period without any um, fundamental um, change to quality of service. And the H, uh, H2 service revenue outperforming the H1 with less data traffic. So indicating that the quality of the, of the subscriber and the traffic is substantially better. Um, as you can see there, we've, we've continued to keep service revenue on an upward trajectory. If I can move on to the next slide, the evolution of the customer base in pursuit of profitability. I think this is a, is a big step change uh, for the industry. It certainly, to my mind, can does prove that we are having a reduction in subscribers with an increase in service revenue. Uh, one of the big things behind that was obviously that if you're carrying a huge amount of traffic on your network, there is a, a, a forfeit of quality of service. Um, and so that has been certainly something that that we've tried to maintain over the, the, the second half of the year. So with uh, reducing of what I would call non-profitable traffic on the network, we've managed to actually enhance the quality of the network. And I think that's manifested nicely in the service, service revenue uh, growth line, which you can see is, is on a nice upward trajectory that we have there. We're also obviously pursuing much more profitable customers and removed uh, products and increased focus on retail product pricing so that the proposition is stronger for the customer. Uh, what one of the, the examples was that the cancellation of the wholesale fixed LTE services, you would have read about that, uh, that would, would have been the deal that was done with, with uh, internet solutions. If I carry on, um, I know that there will be a lot of talk about and questions most likely around the 2.9 million customers lost. Um, but as I say, I don't believe these were bona fide customers on the network and you had a huge amount of I believe irrational pricing in the market sort of over the 29 period as the networks are all scrambling to try and keep subscribers on the on their basis but it is clear that they do have a, a, an impact on this on on the quality of the network and ultimately on the profitability of a network in terms of managing the yield so we, we we're very clear that we want to make sure that we have good customers and we offer the correct product to that customer um, and more importantly that we do not uh, grow the subscriber base at any cost The wholesale model remains robust, um, which is contributing 7% of the network service revenue. Uh, value propositions proposed by the MVO, MVNOs is creating new demand for subscribers. So you're seeing a, a very nice wholesale subscriber growth rate. The reduction in the wholesale revenue over December was really related to a repricing that we'd had in it. And we're, we're finding that we're continuing with the strong uh, MVNO subscriber growth, which is, which is very um, heartening for the business. The operational expenditure story, the big thing here out of that was was the necessity for us to be able to take cost out of the business um, that was harming the business. Uh, as you will have seen, we've, we've reduced almost 18% on the operating expenditure when comparing H1 to H2 as we right size the, the, the operations for, for, for future growth. It's very important to understand that we are very clear that we cannot save a business to profitability. And so we are very cognizant of taking out costs that are not associated with revenue generation or revenue protection. And that was very much uh, part of the narrative. We do believe that the going forward position will allow us to continue on the um, right sizing of expenditure and the cost base. As the risk profile of the company changes post recap, we should have an opportunity that will be in there to be able to negotiate better deals with, with the subscriber base. Uh, with the supplier base. 
having a look at that, you will see that um, between H1 and H2, we obviously had uh, network expenditure stayed more or less flat, but commercial expenditure coming down by 36% and administrative overheads coming down by around 25%. Uh, very important indicators to see there. Um, obviously, the depreciation, amortization, impairment had to talk to you. The annual impairment of the fixed assets and tangible assets was concluded, which resulted in an impairment of 3.2 billion. This is in accordance with IFRS. And really what we have here is a timing difference in the sense that we are not allowed under the IFRS rules to consider the benefits of the recapitalization and an extended roaming agreement within the context of where we find ourselves um, on the balance sheet. So we're sitting there obviously with this um, 4.2 versus 3.2 um, uh, final impairment story. Going on now to the balance sheet, I think the key highlight out of the balance sheet for me is the fact that we haven't actually taken on any more debt. Uh, the network asset line is, is relative to the impairment and the intangible asset line the same. Trade receivables and other assets, um, obviously we are managing the trade receivables as tightly as we can to support the liquidity platform going, going forward. Um, loans and borrowings, I'm happy to say, is down by 3% and then other liabilities and provisions also down um, by 15%. Lease obligation slightly up as we've moved around in the leases. But what is obvious to see here is that the net liabilities are starting to come down. Um, and I think it was it was testimony to the amount of cash EBITDA that had come through to the business that allowed us to get to a position where we were in actual fact able to pay down a slight amount of debt. And more importantly, not to be increasing debt on our balance sheet, which is which has been sort of the way the business has operated. Now, whether you were putting in a lot of capex and carrying on debt to to the balance sheet at the same time, the yields were not adequate. So you sort of had a bit of a perfect storm with how fast do you build out a network in the old strategy relative to how much debt you're able to take onto your balance sheet. And it was quite clear that we were never going to be able to take on long-term debt in, 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 in expanding a capital network and, and getting the growth in the business to support the repayment of that debt, especially given that our average cost of capital is still around circa 15%. So you had a double whammy in the sense that you had high debt followed with a high cost of capital as well. The, going into the analysis of the debt and the finance charges, I think this slide is, is, is it just talks to where we are in terms of debt and, and interest and obviously the forex, but the cost of, of, of funding remains excessively high and, and something that has to be resolved with the recapitalization of the business. Uh, we still obviously, I'm sure, will have a, a, a reasonably high amount of cost of funding going into it as obviously post recap, you're going to have additional funding coming into the business. But the big thing is that we have not increased the debt. So I kind of, I know I'm laboring the point a little bit, but I, I think it's very important that we understand that. If I look at a breakdown in the long-term debt, um, going down from 8.9 to 8.7, subsidy reduced there from 865 to 686 million. And then obviously there's nothing changed in the in the principal debt of the business, other than to say it's 264 lower, and that if we were to take uh, static foreign currency, um, we would have actually reduced the debt by almost 352 million. So debt reduction in trying times being the takeaway from here. Going to the way forward, I think it's very important to understand um, some of the of the key message I'd like to get over to everybody in the room. The turnaround strategy has delivered improved operational efficiencies with the positive impact of these changes flowing through the latter six months of the reporting period. Operationally, the business is most certainly stronger. We are still burdened with debt, which does impact our cash and our liquidity position. The successful recapitalization with a manageable debt stack will secure the long-term sustainability of this business. And there's most definitely a business case for this business, I believe, on what we have delivered uh, between the two half years. Despite the economic conditions of last year, we've, re we've maintained our revenue levels throughout the past year. We will continue to focus on the operational activities um, as this is, this is an important part of, of, of containing the margin and making sure that we can actually get an expanded, uh, expanded margin. We are confident that the strategy is correct in moving to a lower CapEx type of a model and, and, an, uh, and the uh, CapEx for OPEX substitution. Obviously, we will be cognizant of the operational cost not being more than the, the, the um, substitution of the um, capital cost. We do expect that the recapitalization will, it will take a, a month or two still longer, and the delays in that have really been uh, just on the back of getting everybody into, in, into the same room. 
Um, but it is a complex transaction and all our parties remain vested in it and we will obviously keep you up to date. But this is not so much a management issue as a shareholder issue more than that at the moment. Um, that said, I think I'm done with the presentation. Um, I believe we've, we've had a good story to tell and I think there's a real solid case for this business uh, going forward. Thank you very much. Right, so we'll move on to the questions that have come through on the webcast link, um, starting with Jonathan Kennedy Good of SVG Securities. His question is, is one of the conditions precedent for the recap that the MTN roaming deal be signed? <clears throat> Can you, everybody hear me? Um, yes, that is correct. Um, it, is, it is a CP and the MTN deal is, is signed at the moment. The second one, Nicholas DeFost of Camden asks, are you able to quantify what benefits we can expect from the MTN roaming deal on a free cash flow basis after all capex and interest, but pre-recapitalization? Um, at this stage, we can't really give comments on the actual cash flows being generated out of it because we've obviously got um, NDAs and the like in place with MTN and it's also market sensitive information for them. But I think the takeaway there is that obviously we as a business would not enter into a deal where we would be uh, prejudiced by, by a roaming charge in the CapEx for OPEX substitution. So we're very cognizant of the fact that this is a CapEx OPEX substitution and as a result, we need to be able to grow a revenue line with the associated cost on the same type of basis that the, any other net network would have been rolling out CapEx. Right, next question from Edward Pinar of Tantalum. What is the next phase of the roaming agreement with MTN envisage? What does it envisage? Okay, so really you must be remembered that we, we have just extended the roaming agreement. So we already roam uh, in the rural areas with MTN and effectively what would happen now is we would just start to migrate the whole network over at the radio access side to, into, into the next phase. Two questions from uh, Edward again. What would your total payment to MTN go up to? Which costs fall out of sell fee then and why? Um, so the first one I'm not going to be able to answer as a result of, of obviously the, the market sensitive information towards MTN. But what costs would effectively fall out of the network is the, is the radio access side of it. What's also more important to understand is that we're not, we, we are actually getting a like for like type of a network, both in terms of its um, uh, ubiquitous coverage as well as its uh, close to quality of service offering. So that is very important to understand for us to be able to sell product and to acquire the right type of subscriber, which we previously have not been able to do due to the fact that the, the, the roaming was sort of half between a roaming deal with a Vodacom and an MTN that we'd had and what we were trying to roll out ourselves. So it's important that you have a like-for-like -like network, a like-for-like -like, uh, coverage and quality, and that will allow you then to be able to design your product set and your customer acquisition strategy from there. If I could just add to what Douglas has said, just so we're clear, our roaming costs will go up, our finance lease costs will we'll drop down. down, and our capex will drop down significantly. So net net, we'll be better off and from a cash flow perspective than we are on an as is scenario. The next one is, what has trading been like in S2020? So if, if it, it's not been an easy 2020, but um, as comparative, the next uh, set of results will compare H1 to H1. Um, and presently we are maintaining a trajectory despite the, 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 the same trajectory, despite difficult trading conditions. I think what's going to be important is to see what comes out of really a change in everything post this coronavirus. And then obviously, you know, the Rand dollar and a number of other things are going to be problematic for us going into it. So it's going to be a tight, it's going to be a tight 2020 for everybody, I think. And how will the CONCON settlement from uh, MTN and Vodacom affect your revenues and profits? If I can answer that question, I see there's a number of people that are asking questions with regards to CompCom. So let me answer that all in one go, if you, if, if you don't mind. So it's important to understand that Chelsea never had a beef with, with the CompCom. The, 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 the data inquiry findings were really more talking towards what Vodacom and MTN were doing. Um, we had an agreement with CompCom that we would support any um, uh, uh, lifeline packages. We don't have a problem with that at all. And that's in line with what we would do with the coronavirus, where we'd look at 
uh, free use of uh, free uh, zero rating of URLs into education sites and the like. But I think I'd like to remind everybody that the biggest price reduction on the one gig, which was from 150 to 100 rand, we already did in 2018. So the the actual position today is that that neither MTN nor Vodacom have reduced their prices below us, okay. or Telcom for that matter. The next question is from David Lesh, um, Sandlum. What is the H219 versus H218 revenue in Ibiza? Um, were the comments that a year and year comparison is more appropriate to understand the business properly? Um, sorry, let me just get that question again. Um, uh, so the H219 versus H218 revenue in Ibiza change? Were no, the um, okay, I'm clear. No, I don't think so. Yeah. Because in effect, we took over the business and started managing the liquidity platform and the and the new type of a strategy that only took place in the beginning of March 2019. So in actual fact, the a comparative to 18 and 19 H2 uh, wouldn't, in my mind, be, be be relevant because a number of the initiatives that we'd taken that was the contributor to the to the billion change in the EBITDA. Are, are, are permanent fixtures in it. So I think the next good comparative will be H1 and H1 as opposed to the full year. That was why we were at, uh, made sure that we wanted to unpack what the differences between the two half years were. I think you should also remember that uh, the roaming, the initial roaming deal with MTN only kicked in in about November of 2018. So you're not going to get a full comparative uh, given the roaming charge was only for a month, a month, probably six weeks, I would say. Okay, another question from Amit Singh is, are you seeing any increase in traffic and service revenue recently given COVID-19 and the trends seen throughout the industry? Um, yes, we are. We're seeing minutes of use climb um, quite higher up on the network now. That I think has been a common uh, across all of the networks. Obviously, the request for data and data products is going to be, have to be balanced off with what we can do as an industry. So there will be a continual pricing pressure, I believe, but I think we need to look at making sure that we can um, carve up the customer base properly and the products that the customers need to be getting to, to, to line up. I think this is an opportunity in the industry for us to look at how we reprice and how we package products going forward. But yes, it's, it's, it's certainly been good for us, but we also have an obligation as, a, as an industry to support some of this and not be opportunistic. From John Kim at uh, UBS, given the change in the customer base, please give us some color on your churn rates now. Well, our churn rates will, our churn rates are, are are still going to be at the at the levels that they were as we start to take out uh, the, the the balance on the base. The the question I think that you're trying to ask is 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 how much further would we lose subscribers going into into the 2020 year, and at what point do we believe we've hit the the, the core base of subscribers that we want to be maintaining. And I'm probably of the view that we've got a, a, a little bit more customers to lose, um, and then we will have hit, hit the base of, 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 the, of what I regard as the not so profitable customers. Another one from John Kim is, if you back out non-cash charges in your total interest cost this year, what's your average blended uh, cost of debt? Let that answer that one. Yeah, so um, it, it's a little bit difficult because we used 1439 as our rand dollar, and bear in mind we we don't have any hedges in place. Um, those hedges we cancelled uh, because of the requirement for cash collateralization, which would have sucked liquidity. Um, so on our bonds and uh, the uh, CDB loan, those two are dollar denominated. We've got about a 15.6% weighted average cost of uh, debt, bearing in mind that we've we've got an, um, a standstill. It's an informal standstill agreed with our creditors. So we just we haven't been paying interest since about June or July of last year. Uh, we've just been capitalizing the interest. Um, once the recapitalization is done, we'll be able to give you a better better number to that. From Brad Vabetsky of Equinox. On the prepaid side, is there a reason to think that subscribers will stabilize around current levels and that the um, EBIT generation is sustainable? Um, yes, we do believe they will. Um, I, think, I think what's important to look at uh, with regards to the subscriber loss is that there's a number of 
of parts of it. The first part is what I call this washing machine of SIMs that has been pushed into the market. There's circa 100 million plus SIMs going into the market, and these ones are sort of kind of sitting in distribution channels and the like. That's why every now and then you'll read about a finding of all the network SIMs piled up in a rubbish dump. So that's that's just inefficient. The second thing where we will be able to get garner advantage is that you'll many times see a phone with a couple of SIMs in its in its sort of sleeve. So what you've got at the moment is that a lot of people are using each separate network for their best possible deal. And now that we've got adequate capacity in the network, we will be able to put product sets together that would allow us to be a much stronger on-net type SIM or the primary SIM in the card. That's an advantage that we've got. And I believe that we will be able to um, translate that into sustained EBITDA for this year. Okay. And then from uh, Peter Combers of Merza Market, when does the company expect the recapitalization to be completed? And what is the optimal level of debt for South Sea going forward? Douglas, do you want me to take that question? Yes, you can take it. Um, so, so in response to the recapitalization, we've uh, done a business plan and engaged with shareholders and lenders. Uh, the business plan is on the back of a new business model showing the cash flows with MTN Phase 2 roaming in it. Um, on the basis of that, we think that uh, the shareholders and lenders can agree uh, terms on a recapitalization within the next month to six weeks. Um, and once that is done, we think that um, we'll be able to be in a better position to give the market an update on what that looks like. Uh, could you please repeat the second question? Okay. The second question is, does the company expect to introduce any new lenders to the recapitalization exercise? Um, so, before that... Yeah. Sorry, what, the, what the, is, the question was also around what is our debt, uh, ideal the debt. debt. Yeah. Okay, so let me answer that one first. With regard to what we think uh, a sustainable debt level would be, would be dependent obviously on the cash flows in our business plan. Um, we think that there is scope in our cash flows for the next five years to be able to sustain at least between three and four and a half billion rand worth of debt. We'd obviously like it to be a much lower number, but we are able to take debt given the, the operating performance from last year together with the new business model going forward. Sorry, can you repeat that other question? Um, the other one was, um, does the company expect to introduce any new lenders through the recap exercise? So at this present moment, we are talking to the existing lenders in terms of trying to get a recapitalization done. We've had numerous queries from uh, new lenders into the business, uh, bearing in mind that this will probably be a debt structured deal going forward. Um, and we continue to discuss it with them. Um, but for now, we are trying to talk to the existing lenders to see if we can make it work with them. Well, from Alex, will you still require 2G, 3G roaming on Vodacom post the full implementation of phase 2 MTN? No, we won't. Um, and the Vodacom agreement will run its normal course. Right. From uh, Mergent, uh, from Peter. Please provide debt sensitivities at current forex rates, especially forex stays here for rest of 2019, for rest of 2020. So that's a bit difficult because the recapitalization will necessarily mean that we will renegotiate our debt. Um, so I think that we'd probably pass on that. Um, I think post recap would be able to give you a better indication of what that looks like. Right, from um, Bianca of Reorg, with regards to the NTN roaming agreement, can you please get an update on whether this contract has started or is it on hold until recap starts? So the okay, so NTN roaming agreement, we've, we've agreed in principle to the terms of the roaming agreement. What we are working on now is the transition and how the transition will take place, as well as the timing of that transition. Um, so we're trying to disconnect the recap from uh, the MTN phase two. Douglas, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, no, just that it must be remembered that it's an extension of the existing agreement um, as we move into phase two. So we are already making use of the fact that we, we roam effectively in the rural areas and the like. 
So it's, it's really to do with the transition of it and, and to get it moving as fast as possible so we can migrate out of the old model and into the new model. And then a guidance on the impact of uh, COVID-19 on operations and uh, recap. Okay, so in terms of COVID on operations, I think that it's going to present quite a good opportunity for mobile networks and the way we do business. Um, obviously, there's going to be an increased demand for, for working from home type of environments and data. As I've alluded to earlier, I think that the opportunity will lie in the product sets that we put out to the market now. We've obviously got to balance that up with, with, with what we can do as a responsible corporate citizen. Um, but I, I think that, funnily enough, that this industry is the one that's going to be well positioned to, to um, do better or sustain itself over a COVID period. Okay. I think the other thing that needs to be noted is that I think there will be, in my mind, much uh, different ways of doing business uh, post this, especially if it's going to be a protracted uh, potential lockdown or something like that as people um, look into different ways of doing business. With regards to the supply chain in the in the organisation, it's still working perfectly okay. It's got it's a deep and well rehearsed supply chain, um, and we're managing that risk as we would any other retailer. Yeah, with regards to the recap, the COVID nineteen hasn't really affected us because we were already on conference calls in any event, so it hasn't really slowed us down from that perspective. Okay, from Bianca, the handset financing owed to CEC was 1.1 billion, according to the Blue Label conference call. How much is it now? Uh, the last number that I had was 950 million, um, but I'll be able to confirm that uh, after this call. And uh, asking for more details on which debt reduction, um, which instruments were paid down? Um, so I'll refer to slide 26 um, in the slide deck. Okay. Then can you give any details on how negotiations are going with senior secured creditors on, on recap coverage? Yeah, so, so MOLUS uh, have been appointed as the uh, financial advisors for the ICA lenders. Uh, Houlihan, Loki have been appointed uh, for Blue Label. Um, we are having weekly calls in terms of shareholders and lenders to try and come to some uh, midpoint in the negotiation, and progress is uh, encouraging. As I said previously, we will be expecting that within the next month to six weeks that we'll be able to announce something, um, that we've reached some type of agreement. But again, as Douglas said in his presentation, these uh, negotiations are complex. There's multiple stakeholders across multiple jurisdictions who have different economic interests and securities, and we're trying to make sure that we're all working off a common information platform, hence the reason for this taking long. What Douglas and I have been able to do over the past eight to nine months has made sure that the performance of the business has been strong enough so that it gives the shareholders and lenders something to negotiate to. Um, and as Douglas said, that's a negotiation that they will need to have. Um, again, from Bianca, can you confirm whether there are talks to sell the subscriber book to Vodacom? Yeah, we confirm there isn't. Um, and lastly, in the event Telcom is still interested in Selfie, what is the breakup fee on phase two roaming deal on NPN? Sorry, guys, we're going to have to respect NDAs in place. Yeah, I can't give you that. Alright, that uh, concludes from the webcast. If there's anything else on the conference call. Just to note for those parties on the conference call, if you wish to ask a question, please press star and then one now. We'll pause a moment to see if we have any questions. It would appear we have no questions on the conference call. Thank you, that concludes it. Thank you very much then. Ladies and gentlemen, that then concludes this conference and webcast. You may now disconnect.